The Travel in Paradise podcast is intended for mature audiences. This means you will hear realistic adult language such as and go f ha. Audience discussion is devised. Advised. What is knob polishing? You're gonna make me say this. I am a neglected man. Uh, I like to think that I look like a Jack, even though my name's really Bob. Does he have danglers or something? Well, it's time to go do them lighthouse duties. Sitting in the cheese. Sitting in the cheese at the old Walmart to cool off. That should be the headline. If man we were... tasered in the nuts after stealing beef. Yeah, but you're not going to sit in the cheese. You're not going to sit in the cheese, and you're not going to put rib ice down your pants either. House cleaning is oh, secondary. So what is the Viagra Triangle? Possibly we ate in your digestion. I don't know if his little hand is smaller than his little ears or Aww. what. Well, maybe he has a syndrome. <laughs> you want to go check out my RV? It's parked right around the corner. Because I'm pretty sure that I saw some moose knuckle. No. There is absolutely some moose knuckle going on. My swampy friend. What the hell is a swampy friend? <laughs> no. So they're not going to get any scraping on their shaft. Right. Yes, I'm going to do a more dog. Okay, pretty lady you had on those gosh darn sexy leather looking shorts ladies and gentlemen and assholes gather around it's time for another action-packed episode of trouble in paradise hi i'm nigel kent and i'm jasmine and welcome to Trouble in Paradise, the podcast that covers politics to the paranormal, conspiracy theories to crazy Karens, and all the weird news in between from our studio in Southwest Florida. And today we are going to return uh, with our 40th podcast episode to uh, uh, a subject that we've just begun covering uh, because we're coming up on the anniversary of September 11th. And uh, we will soon have 19 years passed since that terrible day. And we're unpacking some of the mysteries of 9-11. When you say we cover conspiracy theories, it's probably the granddaddy of all conspiracy theories because it's so deep and multifaceted. Um, that we've seen so far. Well, I don't... Or don't, to be revealed. I don't want there to be a worse one. <laughs> True. Uh, I want 9-11 to... I mean, I want it to get solved in all of its details, but really, uh, I don't want there to ever be anything worse than 9-11 for people to have to scratch their heads about. Uh, it's, I think it's probably the darkest event of our lifetimes, maybe. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I no, know. I agree with that. Um, aside from the way things are today, um, all that aside, um, definitely, I think... Everybody would agree, probably the most tragic thing that we've witnessed in our lifetime. Yep. And on our last 9-11 episode, which was the an episode primarily devoted to the conspiracy theory around United 93, mm -hmm. we uh, introduced this series, which we're going to do several episodes about 9-11 conspiracy theories. And in that episode, you kind of shared with us how some celebrities kind of dodged a bullet uh, during 9-11. And I think maybe you were going to share with us how some normal everyday folks also dodged a bullet that morning. Uh, isn't that what you prepared? I did. And, you know, it's not, uh, there's, they call them, you know, the twists of fates uh, amongst the people of 9-11. And uh, it wasn't just celebrities. I mean, there were so many people and so many stories. Um, so I, I just pulled a few um, that uh, piqued my interest. Uh, the first was Joseph Lott. He was a sales representative for Compaq Computers, survived one of the deadliest days in modern American history because he had a penchant for art ties, neckties featuring famous masterpieces. On the morning of September 11, 2001, he had put on a green shirt before meeting colleagues at the Marriott Hotel, sandwiched between the Twin Towers. In advance of speaking at the conference that day at the restaurant Windows on the World, over breakfast, his co-worker, Elaine Greenberg, who had been on vacation the week before in Massachusetts, presented him with a tie she'd spotted on her trip that featured a Monet. It was red and blue primarily, 
It was very, I was very touched that she had done this, Lot explained. I said, this is such a nice gesture, I think I'm going to put this on and wear it as I speak. She said, well, not with that shirt. You're not going to put on a red and blue tie with a green shirt. So when breakfast was done, his colleagues headed up to the windows on the world, located on the 104th floor of the North Tower. And Lot went back to his hotel room to change shirts. He ironed a white one, put it on, and then headed back down towards the lobby hotel. As I was waiting to go from the seventh floor back down to the lobby and over the bank of elevators that would take me to the top, I felt a sudden movement in the building, he recalled. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, you would like me to read one? Okay. Um, Monica O'Leary thought her luck had taken a turn for the worse on Monday afternoon when she got laid off from her job but the fact that she didn't go to work on Tuesday turned out to be nothing short of miraculous for her. She had worked as a software salesperson for eSpeed, Inc., a technology company with offices on the 105th floor of the World Trade Center. You know, normally you get pretty bummed out when you get fired, right? But not, I guess she was bummed out for a minute until she realized that it saved her life. Um, yeah, and a follow-up on that one. Um, unfortunately, because so many people had perished, she ended up getting that job back. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Talk about a twist of fate. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Greer Epstein, who works at, or worked at Morgan Stanley and Company office on the 67th floor of the World Trade Center, escaped possible injury by slipping out for a cigarette just before a 9 a.m. staff meeting. Bill Trinkle of Westfield, New Jersey, had planned to get an early start on his job as sales manager for Trading Technologies Incorporated, a software concern with offices on the 86th floor of the World Trade Center's Tower One. But after fussing with his two-year-old daughter and hanging curtains in her bedroom, he missed the train that would have gotten him into the office about an hour and a half before the attack. Instead, he took a later train directly to visit a client company where workers hugged him as soon as he walked through the door. Hmm. For others, a decision to defy orders proved life-saving. Michael Moy, a software engineer for IQ Financial Incorporated, was at his workstation getting ready to write software on the 83rd floor of World Trade Center Tower 2 when the first jetliner struck Tower 1. A few minutes later, he says, building security came on it the speaker and instructed occupants to remain in their offices saying that it would be more dangerous in the streets due to falling debris from the other building disobeying those orders moy and his boss told the 15 or so employees in their wing to start heading down the stairs once again an announcement came over the speaker system instructing employees to return to their respective floors a few employees decided to do so and headed toward the lobby's elevators Just then, the doors of several elevators exploded, apparently because the second hijacked airplane had slammed into the building just a few floors above them. Pandemonium followed, but being familiar with the stairway systems in the building, Moy and his boss directed co-workers to a little-used stairway that was relatively empty. As a result, dozens of people were able to hurry downstairs and escape into the street. I'm glad we acted the way we did, says Moy. Otherwise, I wouldn't have be having this conversation with you. Lastly, we have Joe Andrew. Joe, a Washington lawyer and former chairman of the Democratic National Committee, had a ticket for seat 6C on the ill-fated American Airlines Flight 77 from Dulles to Los Angeles, but switched to a later flight at the last minute. I happen to be a person of faith, says Andrew, but even if you aren't, anybody who holds a ticket for a flight that went down will become a person of faith. Yeah, I think that those people were probably quite grateful for those inconveniences and those um, kind of uh, interventions of fate that occurred Mm -hmm. in their lives that day. Um, So, you know, every time you get slowed down or delayed or something doesn't work your way and you can't meet your schedule 
it's probably important to think about the potential tragedy that you might have avoided as a result mm -hmm. of that. I actually do that. You know, it's I try to keep it, things into perspective because we never know. Um, you know, we get aggravated in traffic and and oh, I'm getting I'm hitting every red light. Well, what if and and we don't know. Yeah. We could have saved you some other collision on down the road or something. Absolutely. We never know. We never know. And uh, that's what is so compelling about some of these stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we move on to the next segment of this episode where we're going to talk about the colors of uh, the World Trade Center damage, the, the, the Towers 1 and Towers 2, Towers 1 and 2, I should say, the colors of the damage and um, what those colors mean. Uh, why don't you tell everybody that's listening and watching how to reach us? Well, they can reach us at tipcast239 on Twitter, trouble239 on Instagram, trouble at trouble239.com to email us, trouble in paradise on YouTube, audio versions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. And if you haven't already, check out our new Patreon, patreon.com slash trouble239. Even if it's just to hop on and read some of our um, uh, fun membership selections, um, Nigel did an excellent job putting our Patreon together. Oh, I did the best I could. And also check out the uh, our friends' podcast, Paradise After Dark. Uh, Ken and Lauren do a great podcast about true crime. Yes, and uh, they are definitely worth listening to and subscribing to. Uh, they also have a uh, YouTube channel with their with their episodes posted as well. And they have a Patreon as well, too. So here is a picture of a blast furnace. Have you ever seen... Now this is a gentleman that's operating a... It looks like slag runoff from a blast furnace. Um, but you've probably seen images of blast furnace before, right? Um, quite truthfully, no. Well, this is... Uh, Only in a movie. Like Terminator or something like that? Yeah, I mean... and I. To say I've actually seen one, like a, any kind of a documented one, I, I can't say that I have. Well, I used to have a client in Cleveland. I'm not going to say the name of the company, but I used to have a client that did uh, steel castings and iron castings, but mainly they were uh, steel alloy castings to make engine blocks for locomotives and giant generators. And their their customer was a company called Caterpillar. You've probably heard of them. They of course, big yeah. construction equipment. Yeah, huge. And this particular foundry had a blast furnace that was um, really, really cool to see. They would operate all year round. And, of course, during the winter, you could walk on the campus of this place and immediately take off your winter coat if the blast furnace was running, which it just about always was. Um because of the amount of heat that it generated. Uh, and so this guy that is working with this slag pit here, he's manipulating something. He's using some kind of a tool to manipulate the slag. Uh, there's a reason why he's wearing that jacket, and it's, uh, it's an insulating and reflective jacket designed to reflect heat away from his body. That's how hot Right. Because uh, he's standing in front of metal well, that is probably 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. I was going to say that's the kind of uh, suit that you see somebody that's uh, around like volcanic. Yes. Like a volcano in Hawaii and they're around like the volcanic uh, lava and stuff mm -hmm. um, that they have to wear because it's so hot. Yeah, it's very hot. So just to put that in perspective, the melting point of steel is 2700 degrees fahrenheit and we're gonna we're gonna talk strictly fahrenheit because we're americans here Merkin. uh i just want you to keep a couple of other important numbers in mind if you can okay uh so the melting point of steel is 2700 degrees the melting point of aluminum or as martin Geddes might say aluminium is 1220 degrees okay the boiling point of aluminum 4,480 degrees. Uh, the burn temperature of jet fuel, 1,500 degrees. The burn temperature of polyester, 1,700 degrees. And when they say burn temperature, what that means is that that's the heat generated by the flame when that particular fuel source is burning at an optimum uh, oxygen saturation. 
So those are some very uh, high temperatures. You wouldn't want to be in the midst of any of those. I can't even conceive the boiling point of aluminum, 4,480 degrees. That sounds like the surface of the sun or something. Uh, maybe the sun's a lot hotter. I don't really know. But there it is, 2,700 for melting steel, 1,220 for melting aluminum, 400 or 4,480 for boiling aluminum. 1,500 degrees is, is burning polyester. Now, these are what they call steel billets. Uh, a steel billet is a um, oblong, not oblong, but it's a uh, it's a rod of steel that's available in different. Uh, it can be round. It can be square. This happens to be a square billet that's seven inches across and seven by seven billet, and then they're shipped in various lengths depending on what you need to do with them. You can see that these billets are stacked in sort of a waffle formation. And in order to melt a steel billet, uh, you need about upwards of about an hour and 15 minutes to melt a steel billet in a blast furnace. So that blast furnace that we were looking at was um, capable of melting one of these billets in about an hour and 15 minutes. Okay, and that's seven inches. That's seven inches across. Okay. Now, when you look at the core columns that were removed from ground zero, these are uh, steel. They're very, very hard steel, uh, and they're very, very big. They're thick. Those skinny points on the far right and far left are five to ten inches thick, and the midsections uh, are up to 53 inches across, uh, and in some cases 60 inches across, depending on how uh, how far close to the bottom of Tower 1 and Tower 2 you were. This is all outlined in the NIST report, and by the way, the NIST report is the official government account of what happened in New York uh, and at Ground Zero. So, 53 to 60 inches across, the thickest part, which is uh, a little bit bigger than the length of this table that we're sitting at. It's quite big. What you don't see on this uh, camera view is that our table is actually, we can fit four people at this table. We've done it before when we've had uh, a couple of guests in the studio. Now, a 7-inch billet this is just roughly how much width a 7-inch billet is going to uh, show in this photo. For size comparison, you can see how much smaller a 7-inch billet is compared to one of these uh, core columns inside the World Trade mm -hmm. Center. And it takes a 7-inch billet an hour and a half to melt in a blast furnace, give or take. Uh, if anybody would like to see these sources cited... Uh, we'd be happy to post that in, along in the show notes when, we, when this goes up as a podcast. And the whole point in spelling this all out is that if you were to take that math and extrapolate it across the 53-inch cross-section of the core column, uh, it would actually take 13 hours for a blast furnace to melt the core column of the World Trade Center. 13 hours or more. So what the official report is saying is you got to remember, the official report says no explosives were used other than kerosene fuel or jet fuel. Mm -hmm. Okay, And they're saying that uh, the only source of explosive power or demolition power in Towers 1 and 2 and 7, but we're going to stick with 1 and 2 for right now, mm -hmm. was the jet fuel that was spilled from the aircraft at the point of collision. Because they all say that the collision itself was not enough. The impact, uh, tremor, force, whatever, was not enough. It was the fuel. It was the heat that they say weakened not only the floors into which the plane crashed, but also the 90 floors underneath the crash zone also. To cause a precision drop. A precision drop <laughs> directly into its own footprint. So, but here you have, okay, so we know how we know how to work with a 7-inch steel billet. We know the same material was used in the core columns. So then we can extrapolate from that how long it would take to melt at, at optimal temperatures inside of a blast furnace, 2,500 plus degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take 13 hours to melt the core columns. Uh, and, of course, the time from the impact to the collapse was 
under an hour in the case of the South Tower and about an hour and 15 or an hour and, 15, hour and 20 minutes in the case of the North Tower, I think, right. give or take. So or maybe, would... the, maybe I've got that backwards. But the point is it wasn't 13 hours. Right. But then they'll say, well, you, we can debunk that. You're a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. We we're can... just theorists. No, we're, yeah, we are theorists. <laughs> uh, we're more like cooperation in, uh, theorists, you know, because this was definitely a cooperative effort here. But they say, well, it didn't really have to melt in order for the building to come down. It just had to be weakened. And, and they say that steel can be significantly weakened at half the temperature of its melting point. And half the temperature of his melting point, guess what, is approximately the burn temperature of jet fuel. Okay, remember those numbers we went over? Yeah. If you double the burn temperature of jet fuel, you get a good steel melt in a blast furnace. So that's a ratio of 50%. But let's give those NIST people the benefit of the doubt. And let's take 75% off of these time estimates. So now you've got, in order to weaken but not melt, mm -hmm. three and a quarter hours, again, based on that same estimate from the, the seven-inch steel billet, which is well understood. So if you cut down those melting numbers by 75%, you can, you can interpolate the actual weakening numbers and say, well, the steel would bend, but it would still take three and a quarter hours to get to the point to where it could. Right. And, so, we, and we know based on the report that or many reports that it was between an hour and an hour and a half between yeah. from the time of the impact to the time of the collapse, depending which tower you're talking about, it was either under an hour or a, a little over an hour, like an hour and 20 minutes. And this is under perfect conditions um, and giving them the benefit that it's 3.25 plus hours just to weaken the structure. That's to weaken a core column steel beam in a perfectly optimized blast furnace that's blasting at three to 4,000 degrees. Right. And we're just talking one core column. Yes, because it's the same thing as baking a turkey, right? If you put a turkey that's at room temperature in the oven at 400 degrees, if it's a 20-pound turkey, it's going to be in there for hours and hours and hours. Right. And we're talking about a minimal ratio of temperature change with a turkey. Right. And you could burn one side... Of the turkey, but the other side's going to be raw. If, you're, <laughs> if your if your so heat source is not adequate all the way around that turkey please stop, structure. Please stop describing my 2017 turkey. <laughs> That's mean. I wasn't around in 2017, so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you are you are uh, clairsentient, so maybe that's what's going on there. <laughs> you you might have been here and not realized it. Well, my little crown's going off, so. <laughs> Could be. So, you know, the argument here is how in the world did they do something in an hour or an hour and a half that a blast furnace can't even do in three and a quarter hours? I think you have the answer. Well, there's a great theory about it, but it requires us diving into the colors of 9-11. Let's dive. And we're going to talk about the colors gray, black, and yellow. Okay. Because uh, those are the, the three colors that kind of give away... Uh, some interesting, compelling evidence that, you know, jet fuel really did not bring those towers down. Something else was in play. So, now this is a picture of, the top picture that you see is a picture of um, the exhaust from a solid fuel explosion. Okay, this is a, like an M80, the, the smoke that it produces. And you the can, white. It's white smoke. Okay. So, solid fuel generally produces even in a demolition scenario generally produces white smoke okay the bottom picture is a picture of a we got a structure fire well it's you can't really see but what's in front of there's there's a pile uh where the guy burned off a whole bunch of kerosene at once in a kerosene explosion aka a jet fuel explosion and you can see the difference when the liquid fuel burns it's black smoke mm -hmm. instead of white smoke and this has given rise to a whole lot of speculation. Which, if we actually go back to episode 37 when he showed the pictures of the, um, or the supposed picture that was taken from a distance. Um, of that, United 93 crashing? Of the United 93, that was indeed black smoke, which 
which would, would be consistent with fuel. With the kerosene, yes. It was it was it was black smoke. There wasn't a lot of it. It looked wimpy, right. but it looked very wimpy. But it was the right color at least. Correct. Yeah. So um But that just verifies the source of the black smoke. It does. Black smoke is from explosive liquids or explosive vapors. Uh, and in this case, the kerosene was largely ionized because of the impact. So it exploded instantly and burnt off within 10 seconds. The kerosene was gone within 10 seconds. And you can see how much of the kerosene actually exited out the rear of the North Tower. This is a photograph of the North Tower uh, moment after the impact. One to three, maybe four seconds after the impact. And you can see that due to the amount of red in the foreground mushroom or, or cloud, not mushroom, but the, the foreground smoke cloud, uh, that there was a, a tremendous amount of ionized and evaporated kerosene that was burning in the air, even as that black smoke came out of uh, the exit wound, so to speak, of Tower 2. But there's this other anomaly that has been driving people kind of crazy about the Tower 2 impact, and that is that there is also a lot of white smoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, white smoke is not created by kerosene, and white smoke is not created by any burning substance two to four seconds after the impact of an of, of a, uh, airplane into a tower. Mm -hmm. There's no way anything inside that tower could have burned that quickly and caught fire that quickly to eject white smoke out of the building uh, up to 250 feet just seconds after impact. So the theory here is that, yes, there was a secondary explosion that uh, involved solid explosives, not liquid, but solid explosives, uh, that could only have been either on the plane or planted in the building. And what really bothers me about this photographic evidence is that the white smoke the solid white, I guess solid explosive exhaust, is coming out of the building at a straight 90 degree angle mm -hmm. perpendicular to the direction of travel. I noticed that. And then I also noticed the, um, um, if a plane were traveling inward, that you also have that explosive beyond where your white is, the outward yeah, there's some, there is some yeah. kerosene that looks like it probably, uh, when the plane initially hit, some of the kerosene came out of the entry point, uh, or it spilled out of the side when this other solid explosive blew out the side of the building. So you see that little part where it's black off mm -hmm. to the left there? Yeah. There was certainly some liquid fuel exploding or burning. So much of that side explosion is just dominated by that right. that white smoke cloud or gray, uh, gray and white smoke cloud, which could not have been kerosene. So at, at two to three seconds after impact, which is the maximum time this could have been taken, this particular photo, uh, after the time of impact, there could have been nothing solid burning enough to have within two seconds be generating that much white smoke. That would have come minutes later, if not longer than that. So that all kind of points to the theory that there were physical explosives, physical solid explosives in the building, uh, apparently planted at the point of impact or on the floors that were near the point of impact. I'm going to read you a quote from a study about this real quick. It says... And again, I'll have to find, I'll have to put the link to this in the show notes for people if they're interested in following up. But it says, the white dust lacks any visible evidence of burning kerosene, but was expelled from the tower at least 250 feet. What was the force pushing it out if no jet fuel is seen in it? There is a little bit of jet fuel seen behind it, but not in it. As one looks up at the three fireballs emerging from the explosion that occurred at the crash level of the South Tower... It is clear to see from the color of the flame and soot that the jet fuel is primarily in the front of the fireball. The further one looks to the rear, toward the point of entry, 
the less evidence one sees of burning kerosene, uh, which makes sense because they claim that the craft vaporized as it flew through the structure of the World Trade Center. And as it got caught on those core columns, which almost certainly stopped the plane and tore it apart, all that fuel came out of the wings and just spilled through and vaporized. And so almost all of it would have come out at 500 miles per hour on the other side of the tower, the exit wound. Um, yet there's this sideways explosion. So what do you make of that? Um, it's definitely interesting. I would think that um, there had to have been other explosives that were used. And especially... You think those the, other explosives could have been on the plane? No, I don't think so. Um, because if you look at the... I mean, that's a perfect perpendicular degree to the tower. Yeah, the sideways explosion, you mean? Yes. Yeah. And whenever you look at where your white, your white smoke um, that you're talking about, at, at the 250 foot level mm -hmm. um it's just uh it's too perfect it's that's what i was gonna say mm -hmm. i i don't know i don't know much about flying an aircraft <laughs> but <laughs> i would i would think it would be i don't know anything about it i think it would be extremely wow. difficult to have your craft completely perpendicular with no no variation in the angle of the wings that would cause a, a smoke plume like that yeah. as the white plume. I mean, you would have... Well, if you shoot a bullet at a watermelon... It's going to go down. It deviates down. It deviates a little bit, but it's going to come out the other side of the wall. And it's not going to take a 90 degree turn and then come out the, the precise perpendicular no. angle. No. And so this was traveling at 500 plus miles an hour. Now, obviously, a bullet is a supersonic traveler. That's why that's one of the reasons why you, you can hear pew and everything when it's, you know, it hits you like a sonic boom. But and in, in, not that I have ever been hit by a bullet, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, and I sound like such a douchebag. Right? <laughs> anyway, uh, 500 plus miles an hour, this airplane's coming in. And is it going to send uh, explosive material through the direction of travel? Or is it going to send explosive material 90 degrees to its right out the side of the building? It's, it's a real concern. So there is a theory about how this all happened. And uh, ultimately, they're saying that it resulted in the collapse of both towers, which, as you musingly pointed out earlier. A precision drop. A precision drop. An, an impossible drop. What does this look like to you? Um, you want to maybe describe this photo and tell me what you think it uh, looks like? Well, to me, it looks a lot like the... Um, the first photo that you showed of the gentleman that was, uh, melting, melting the, uh, the steel. Um, I mean, it's, it's a photo where, uh, it's part of the trade center. It looks like it's melting off of the side of the building about, um, what, three and a half, four columns over. So. And it's, it's a bright, uh, bright yellowish orange color. Mm -hmm. Bright yellowish orange. Uh, it's clearly molten metal of some kind. Yeah. I mean, um, it looks like it's dripping. It's not fire. And. No, no, it's melt. It's definitely melting. It's, and it's and not it dripping kerosene because kerosene wouldn't drip. It would just burn up. No, right? this looks like metal drippings. Yep. And judging by, so you see the inset photo, uh, you see how you can look, kind of look up a floor or two in the inset photo there. Mm -hmm. There's the big explosive, uh, fireball is gone now at this point. So this is minutes, maybe many minutes after the initial impact. And so somehow, uh, according to the official story, this kerosene has melted some metal. 
Now we know that the burn temperature of kerosene is, do you remember the jet fuel burn temperature? 1700? 1500. 15. Okay. That was pretty close. I, I have a hard time keeping <laughs> feel track. I feel like I'm being quizzed right now. Uh, and we know that there were two kinds of metal used in the construction of the vertical members of the World Trade Center and in the floors. The most prominent of them was steel. Mm -hmm. The second most prominent of them, and, and by second most I mean like maybe 10% of the exterior, the window right. frames and so forth the used framing, aluminum. Aluminum, yep. Uh, do you remember the melting point of aluminum, by chance? No. 1,220 degrees. Uh, and I'm going to show you a photograph of what molten aluminum looks like. Okay. This is aluminum at 1,500, 1,600 degrees. And uh, what color is it? Silver. Okay. Or gray. Silver. Yep. Mm -hmm. It looks like aluminum that's melted. Yep. Dripping. Yeah, it almost looks like one of those silver crayons when you microwave it. Like, you ever do that when you were a kid and try to melt it in the oven or something? No, oh, just like, to me, it looks like somebody dropped a bottle of nail polish. Yeah, but it's it's not glowing. No. It's not... Uh, no, it doesn't even look hot. I mean, really. It so, just... But we know that the jet fuel did burn hot enough to melt the aluminum. Do you think it burned hot enough for long enough to melt the aluminum knowing that all of the jet fuel burned off within eight to ten seconds no so do you think it's possible that the jet fuel set some office furniture and cloth and carpet and things like that on fire while it was exploding it could have but at that then that's where the 1700 degrees came in that was for polyester yep polyester has a, a burn temp of 1700 so like your carpeting and stuff like that would have a lot of polyester in it. Yep. Office furniture, mm -hmm. fabric coverings, curtains. Right. Uh, and that's going to be the predominant flammable material in an office. You're going to have that. You're going to have paper, which burns at 451 degrees. That's nothing. Uh, you probably are going to have some wood, some desks, some chairs perhaps, but all together with a lower burn temp than the polyester because polyester is an oil-based material, and so it has a, a higher burn temp. And I'm trying to give the NIST guys the, the benefit of the doubt by saying that, okay, let's not, let's not worry about the paper because it burns cool. Let's not worry about the wood because it burns cool. Let's talk about the stuff that burns hot right. to try to help them make their point. But even when you do that, you still can't make their point because aluminum has to be upwards of 4,000 degrees before it turns bright yellow like this, which means this could only have been steel. Now, they're saying that the... Uh, there it, wasn't enough... Um, there wasn't enough temperature to melt exactly. it. Exactly. So if kerosene can't melt steel, and we know this wasn't aluminum, it was steel, based on the color, what could possibly have gone south here? Like, what do you think happened? We know there was white smoke. That's evidence of solid explosives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can even see more white smoke uh, coming out of the... Uh, uh, above where the um, steel is melting? Yep. So you st if you have white smoke, then you still have a, um, a high heat source that's still burning. But it's a solid heat source, more and than likely. And it's hot enough to melt steel. So does that sound like, uh, can you melt steel with a burning wooden desk? No. Do you think you could melt steel with a polyester curtain? No. All right. Uh, let's see. What else could you find in the office? A carpet? Even a plane that we're burning, the, say, say the aluminum from of the airplane continued to burn. Well, aluminum doesn't burn. It's metal. It'll melt. Melt. Yeah. So, I mean, but just saying that... They're using that as a rationale. All that while the plane would continue to burn and, and then yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Um, none of it makes sense other than something else had to be potentially used to melt the steel. So now we have two pieces of evidence now for a secondary explosive besides the jet fuel. We've got white smoke at the point of impact and shortly thereafter. And we have 
and and, and as a second part to that, white smoke shooting off in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And now we have molten now, steel. A question: Is this um? What side of the tower is are we looking at? Here? I'm not sure what angle like this orientation. is. Orientation is the. This appears to be. This looks like the side gash and not the uh, entry or exit wound. Okay. Uh, this might be the the, the face to... where the sideways explosion came from. Because see, I, what I'm looking at is that in your picture there, um, in the upper right, um, where you can see a little bit of the blast pattern too. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to figure out. Well, there's, there's definitely some things blown outwards. But so, the direction of all of it also doesn't make sense to me. It, it's not completely an outward. You know, to be fair, uh, this is not, these aren't the best photos cause these mm -hmm. are still frames from video. And I don't know that any really good photographs exist of the molten steel. It's mostly video where somebody was on a 300 line well, TV camera zooming in uh, well, you know, 300 you, feet on this stuff. And think about the limited amount of time that um, really people had to actually get any kind of. Yeah, an hour and 20 minutes in the case of the one tower. And and I don't think anybody was shooting film of the North Tower when the South or uh, the the. Uh, south tower when the north tower came down like i think people were like yeah fuck it i'm out of here unless they were in a, a helicopter or, and by then there was so much debris and just white dust clouds everywhere that who they wouldn't have been able to film anything so all the the photographic evidence of this kind of stuff that does exist is from before right the the first tower fell down um but yeah i, I think they're it's queer looking for sure it mm -hmm. definitely doesn't look uh doesn't look real great but this is molten aluminum uh aluminum molten aluminum is not yellow and we know that nothing ever came close to 4,000 degrees during that entire event according to the official report so therefore the aluminum could never have turned yellow it had to have been steel so that's the second piece of evidence that there was secondary explosives including uh, an explosive called thermite now thermite um wow it kind of resembles. This is a photo of a of a aluminothermic reaction. Okay. Which, when you light thermite and uh, put it, embed it into a steel uh, fuel source, it basically eats the steel alive, and then it leaves iron and uh, I believe aluminum and oxygen as byproducts of its reaction. And that's interesting because what do you need for in order? For a fire to continue to burn, we need oxygen. Is an oxygen yep. source, so thermite is an would be an optimal explosive because if it byproduct of it is oxygen, well, then it, it would iron, allow iron it, oxide. Yes, it's but it would allow molecule. it to continue to burn. Yeah, I don't know if if thermite can be uh, used without uh, actual oxygen to be consumed. Like you know how there's certain kinds of welding torches and things that work underwater. I don't know if it's that kind of a deal. Uh, if it needs air, oxygen. No, if can... water is H2O. That's There's true. oxygen and yeah. water. So somebody who knows a thing or two about thermite, please chime in on that. Um, but what I think is interesting that I just want to point out real quick in this picture that you're showing um, is that the resemblance of um, where I said it looked like it was dripping mm -hmm. um, off of the... Uh, the first uh, building mm -hmm. that the outward um, portions of the thermite that you're showing here also look like where you're talking about the reaction look very similar to the the dripping kind of uh, pattern well, that do. you could see in the picture thermite uh, throws it, it's a forceful reaction so it, it throws the waste material off of the steel in these little iron oxide globs that they get thrown away from the reaction and they end up coming to rest elsewhere and eventually cooling. Similar um, to, like, I guess you would say, like a sparkler. Yes. How a sparkler what throws out the... Exactly. Or a, a burning magnesium strip throws off uh, little bits of material. And in this case, it does look like a sparkler. This is a photo of a thermo, uh, alumo, aluminothermic reaction, a thermite reaction. So, yeah, it kind of does look like a sparkler. There's little sparks flying off with little smoke entrails. 
And you can see at the very bottom, in whatever's being held up between those two steel rods, mm -hmm. there is melting steel at the bottom of that reaction. Yeah. So um, when you compare that to this, which is another, uh, this is a third photo now of one of these mm. uh, molten steel situations in at the corner of one of the towers. Um, it, it's it's kind of damning. Yeah. It really resembles the thermite reaction. And, you know, the other thing, too, is that... Um, Again... If it were look aluminum, the, it wouldn't be visible in broad daylight, let alone glowing like this. But, okay, but look at, all right, look at the very top of that picture. Mm -hmm. And um, it is the, that color of the melting steel is right at, right at like both corners of the building. You're talking about those red flames at the, yeah. at the corner up at the top there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so something is burning up top. So it's like if you if you were to, let's say, set, have an explosive like thermite um, in each corner of a building, that would that's kind of what it would I would think it would look like if it were melting. Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely there's no question in my mind that it is molten steel. There's no there's no other explanation that that's what it is. Uh, the Prevailing theory is that thermite was used to set up a molten steel reaction because no other fuel source that day could have been possibly hot enough to heat the, the steel quickly enough. We talked about how even in an ideal situation, a blast furnace would have taken the core columns uh, many, many hours to heat to the point where they would have weakened. Hours. 13 hours to melt and three and a quarter hours or more to weaken enough to where the, end, where the NIST says the building would have collapsed. And keep in mind, this is only at the, the, the three or four floors that were directly impacted right. by the impact. They've never said anything about how uh, they have this pancaking theory mm -hmm. that somehow you can, like, you know, if you have a, a hammer that you're putting in a nail and it drives the whole nail down into the ground. But uh, that's kind of impossible, too, because the hammer has a direct downward force which was never applied to the top of the World Trade Center. No, you had a perpendicular force. Yes. So uh, I, I very much believe that there were uh, solid explosives at, on the, the impacted floors, and I think we're going to come to find out in future episodes that there may have been solid explosives on other floors as well. Um, there's a great theory about controlled demolition. But today I just wanted to talk about the colors, the gray versus black smoke, and what that means in terms of uh, what type of uh, fuel sources or explosive fuel sources were involved, and then uh, the color of this glowing metal, right? Is it aluminum, as they claim, or is it steel? And I think it's pretty obvious that they it's sound, actually steel. Yeah. yeah. So I think that uh, we're going to cover... Well, you have to ask this question, right? If that shit was in there to begin with at the time the planes hit, that means somebody had to put it there. I agree. I mean, it just didn't magically appear. They didn't build the World Trade Center with thermite in it. Or did they? No. I mean, there's a there's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> it was built in, what, a built I think it was completed around 78 or 80 or something like that. Tallest building in the world at the time? No, because we won't get into all of the little things, but... All the Larry Silverstein-isms? Well, and, and um, the art. Artists on the floor. Well, that's the next the, episode. Right. We're, we'll just uh, say that there's... Uh, um, we'll leave the door open that there was some suspicious activity that did go on prior to this happening. Yeah. Uh, Very suspicious coming and, and goings. Comings and goings. Thank coming. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the but comings and goings. We're actually going to cover three really intriguing um, scenarios, uh, any three of which individually or collectively could have explained the fact that solid explosives were in fact present 
and that thermite charges were in fact present at the time of 9-11. I hate to do this to you, but just um, can you just real quick go back to the numbers um, and the very beginning where you talked about the um, the heat source? and uh, Sure. Yep, there they are. So I've got them pulled up on the side screen so people watching on YouTube can't right. see it. Okay. Unless you want me to go back to the uh, no. screen share. No, if we can just, uh, for them, uh, maybe just read them off again one more time. All right. Well, the melting point of steel is 2,700 degrees. The melting point of aluminum is 1,220 degrees. The boiling point of aluminum is 4,480 degrees. And it, you have to be in the mid-3,000s before aluminum starts to glow. And, okay, so just on that point there, we saw the what they say was melting aluminum mm -hmm. on the picture, mm -hmm. according to the NTSB report. The, the NIST, yep. Okay, sorry. Okay. Different guy. <laughs> different, different asshole, same boss, probably. <laughs> anyway, okay, so that was... The, that's the boiling point. So that's what they were saying at 4,000. Well, it, it could have melted and dripped without turning yellow. Aluminum melts at, at 1,220 degrees, right? But in order for it to glow, it has to be heated another couple of thousand degrees. It right. has to be in the... And it does not glow that color. Well, there was, well, it glows yellow when it gets that hot, but there was no fuel source capable, and everybody agrees, right. no fuel source capable of heating anything to the mid 3000s that's the point at which aluminum right. would have turned yellow because our 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 source according to the the fuel source the jet fuel is 1500 degree burn 1500 temp. degrees and at most some of the uh, and materials that burned off instantly in, within 10 seconds they say they say within 10 seconds and then you add in um, the 1700 degrees for the, the polyester stuff, the office furniture, in, right? Yep. Still doesn't get us to the number that they're claiming to nope. have uh, an image like that where you see the the melting. There's nothing that was that could have been glowing bright yellow and and liquefying in the way that it did uh, at the temperatures that the NIST report says now. That means they're either wrong about the temperatures, which seems unlikely, or they're wrong about the materials, which seems much more likely because there's a plausible explanation for melting steel, that which might. is, it's Occam's razor. There were other explosives there. That is a simple explanation that makes sense. It makes much more sense than saying, okay, now we all of a sudden have this crazy, miraculous fire from on high that can melt aluminum and turn it yellow at 3,500 to 4,000 degrees, even though there's no fuel source that was there that could possibly ever get that hot. Um, so their bizarro explanation for the molten metal is what really got people turned on to the idea of a thermite reaction. And then later on at Ground Zero... Uh, the investigators began to find tons of iron oxide pellets by the millions. And those are what flies off of a uh, thermite. That's what you were saying. A nanothermite so, is a micro form of thermite that's designed to conceal itself. And those iron oxide pellets are microscopic and can only be viewed under a microscope. Mm -hmm. But there were millions and millions of, of those found in the metal at ground zero as well. And that's really where the real tragedy starts to unfold. Well, I mean, the whole thing's a tragedy because it's a lie built on top of a lie built on top of a lie. And it's so deep. Right. That's why I but, say this is the granddaddy but, of all of them. Well, but what did it, if I refer back to what uh, Martin Getty said in his uh, in his one article um, just paraphrasing, you have to make a lie so big in order to make it believable. Mm -hmm. Like, and well, he was talking said, about the coronavirus, you know, but yeah, that's, that's why I said, hopefully this may just be one of the tragedies that we see in our lifetime. 
Um, but, um, well, but it has we'll to be so that horrendous but, that people are willing to suspend their critical thinking because it's so emotionally compromising right. to go there and to comprehend the consequences of, oh my God. We've this, been lied yes, to this whole time. Nobody wants to be there emotionally. And those of us who have committed to being there emotionally are now we're past that hump and we're trying to figure out what the fuck actually happened. Right. Yeah. And and then and then there's the obvious um, issues of censorship that that begin to happen with this because mm-hmm. you people people don't want people to know. Well, and it's not just uh, media censorship. And it's not just social media censorship. It's also just social social censorship between people. Mm-hmm. Say that five times fast. But people belittling and making fun of other people because they believed something that contradicts what their friend saw on TV. And people have lost estranged family members. There's been Absolutely. divorces. There's been ruined relationships because of this lie. So it promulgates this further darkness in humanity that just seems to spider web out through uh, it's very you know, very it's it's frustrating it really is well and and people say you know well go put on your tinfoil hat and then i'll just have to say well now that it's cooled off i can make it yeah right it, it's it, it melts at 1200 degrees because uh, it's aluminum and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now i can go and make myself a hat thank you very much yes uh i think i prefer a steel hat I think that would uh, protect against more stuff. But uh, in our next 9-11 episode, we're going to cover um, the story that Jasmine was just alluding to, which is if this crap was in fact present, how in the hell did it get there? Mm-hmm. And there's three possible, three really good plausible explanations as to how. There's gonna... some inter- Yeah, there's some interesting stuff. There sure is. And the comings and goings prior to. So speaking of comings and goings. Yes, sir. uh, It's just about time for our going. Uh, So why don't you give everybody a holler about how to get a hold of us. And I'm going to try to figure out how to get this thing to turn off while you're doing that. Absolutely. You can reach us at uh, tipcast239 on Twitter. Trouble239 on. Twitter. (laughs) Trouble239 on Instagram. Instagram. Trouble at Trouble239.com to email us. Trouble in Paradise on YouTube. You always morph into like a (laughs) quasi-Australian. Audio versions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Stitcher? Stitcher. And you can check out our new Patreon at patreon.com slash Trouble239, even if it's just to read our fun (laughs) subscription levels. Yes, uh, and if you like what we're doing, please support us on Patreon. Uh, if you're on YouTube right now, please sub- 